it's very, very hard to go from one person to a team when you're, especially when you're, you get addicted to the drama of doing everything and putting out all the fires. The goal is to, for me to be in the future. So I pretty much offloaded everything onto other people, which allows me now to live in the future. So I can see where we're going in a year, in five years, in 10 years. And so I've been able to plot our whole road to 100 million and beyond. We stand today. The Business Method. The business with method. a shout out. The Business Method. The Business Method Podcast. The Business Method Podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and welcome to the Business Method Podcast, a podcast featuring successful entrepreneurs and high-profile people dissecting their business models. We dissect the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. On our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that have built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that produce over a million dollars in annual revenue. And now we're interviewing 100 major influencers to get behind the minds and the science of using influence to grow business and influence income results, economies, and cultures. There's a growing number of people building these caliber of businesses like this, and we're going to figure out what it takes to make this happen. Now, let's jump in today's show. The Business Method. Hello, listeners. Welcome to the podcast. I am really excited to give you another amazing guest. Um, you know, we have a lot of people reach out to us to come on the show, and a lot of actually third party companies that reach out to us. Uh, we don't, we don't, we vet a lot of them. We don't let a lot of the people that are reaching out to us to come on the show. And this individual, actually, we did for a really good reason. And you'll notice on the podcast why. He's just a phenomenal um, entrepreneur and phenomenal human being, very humble, very excited, very passionate about the business that he's built. It's generated more than $16 million in revenues and the structure of his business. It's the SaaS business, you guys, and believe it or not, it, it helps other people create businesses as well. The structure of his business has created over 25 millionaires, and he says it's due to have another 12 or so coming on in the next few months, which is pretty awesome. His name's Daniel Rosen, and uh, he started out juggling. He got he left home at the ripe old age of, I think, 13 years old, and he started out, believe it or not, guys, juggling on street corners. And then eventually, after a few years of doing that, uh, realized he wanted to do something that was more lucrative, and he got into the TV business growing up in L.A. Eventually, he became the announcer of The Price is Right. So you guys know that voice. Yeah, the come on down guy, that was him. So anyway, the, the business that he eventually built is called Credit Rep Repair Cloud. And Credit Repair Cloud helps other people create businesses that help other people repair credit. And when I first heard this, I was like, well, that's interesting. You know, how's that model work? You know, I was a little skeptical, to be honest. But when I started digging into it, I, th I thought to myself, this is a very, very smart business model. And we talk about all the business heroes out there like, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, Russell Brunson, um, people like this that help other entrepreneurs create business structure. And so what Daniel did is he took that model from Russell Brunson, created it, duplicated it, and created it with its in his own niche with a different product. And he followed that exact model to a T and has built this amazing business that helps a lot of people improve their credit, one, become better entrepreneurs, two, and help other people three. And so what you'll notice about Daniel on the podcast, he's a humble guy. He's got a lot of energy. He's very passionate about what he's doing. He's very transparent when he shares um, about his team and how he built his team. And he gives a lot of credit to some key individuals on his team. And so it's really uh, great to hear. So if you're interested in creative business models, this is a, a must listen to. If you're interested in um, 
entrepreneurs and mindset and and grow, going from a really low place in their lives to creating you know an eight figure business uh, that he actually has the goal and I think he's on path to it to create a nine figure business. Um, this is a key key podcast to listen to. Without further ado, you guys, let's welcome the former Price is Right announcer, the now founder of of Credit Repair Cloud, Daniel Rosen. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Business Method Podcast, you guys. I want to introduce a very special guest here. And the gentleman's name is Daniel Rosen, and, and I'm excited to have him on the show for a few reasons, but I'll give you a short intro, and I think you'll find out why. So after leaving home at the age of 13 to make a living juggling on the street, Daniel ended up in a 25 career, 25 year career on TV, and the longest gig, he was actually the announcer of The Price is Right. So yeah, he's the guy that announced, come on down. And Daniel, we may ask you to say that later in the podcast, but but I'm sure you've never, yeah, I'm sure you've probably done that a few times. But uh, in his life, uh, his life actually took an unexpected turn when a bank error devastated his credit, leaving him on the verge of bankruptcy. So I've been there also, that, so that'll be fun to talk about. And there weren't any solutions out there to help him with the process while fixing his own problem. Uh, so we thought of a way to help others by bootstrapping the world's first credit repair software. And I think it's a very clear clever idea. And you guys will see why throughout the podcast. Um, Credit Repair Cloud was born and now it powers the credit repair industry and has helped thousands of entrepreneurs to become credit heroes. So by changing millions of lives, actually, he's made 25 of them uh, actual millionaires by leveraging the software and using it to start their own credit repair business. And now with over more than 16, with more than 16 million in revenue, Credit Repair Cloud is an industry leader and Daniel is known as one of the most innovative SaaS and CEO, SaaS CEOs that are out there today. Daniel Rosen, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you? Hey, I'm fantastic. Thanks for having me on, Chris. Yeah, I got a good, I got a question. Are you always full of this much energy? Yes, I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> I love what I'm doing. How that's amazing. So, how do you keep uh, high energy levels? Like, as soon as we got on the podcast, you had a giant smile on your face. I could tell you're a really excited and humble guy at the same time, just by your energy and your presence. So, I'm I'm curious how do you how do you how do you keep these levels going for you? I just love what I'm doing, and I was especially excited today because I love talking about what I'm doing, and there's. Very few people, <laughs> you know what it's like. Usually the people in our family and our immediate friends aren't in industries like this. So it's exciting to be able to share it with people who get what you're saying. Absolutely. So I want to talk more about that throughout the podcast, but I know you've got a really great story to tell. And starting out, of course, we want to, we, we all want to know, um, you know, you've done so many amazing things. Uh, we all want to know, like, how you really, how old were you when you started juggling on the streets? Well, I was about 10. Here's what happened was <laughs> I've always been really, really obsessed by things like unusually obsessed and so laser beam focused that the one thing I care about, that's all I care about. And then everything else sort of falls, it doesn't, it doesn't get priority, which is, is, is good and bad. But as a kid, I mean, I, I, it's so bad in me that for a long time I thought I was autistic because I just so focused on whatever it is. And as a kid, it was juggling, and um, and so I I would all all I would do is practice all day, like eight hours a day, every single day, and I got really good at juggling, which is good because home life wasn't very good, and I ended up leaving home at thirteen, and I made a living juggling on street corners. And then I started getting into comedy because I realized if I could make people laugh, they would put more money in my hat. And then I kept practicing and practicing and practicing. I eventually became a world champion juggler when I was 18. And then I thought, I want to do something big time. I want to get off the street corners. And so I thought, what should I do? I, I, I'm a world champion juggler, but maybe I should be in the circus. But the circus was really gross. So then I thought, <laughs> okay, I'm going to be in the ice capades. So I went to the local skating rink and I said, I'd like to have ice skating lessons, please, because I'm going to be in the ice capades. And they said, have you ever skated? And I said, no. And they thought I was crazy. But again, I just obsessed and obsessed and obsessed. And that's all I would do. I'd go in and practice the skating and the juggling 
eight hours a day. And three hours later, I made it into the ice capades. Three hours later? Yeah. Three, oh, wow. Three years uh, later. Then, three years later. You yeah, said three, three hour, hours Oh, sorry. Later. Three years later. <laughs> no, it took a long time. I was like, time. you were really focused, man. It was like, a lot <laughs> of work. It was a lot of work. And then I hated the ice capades. Um, uh. <laughs> I thought it'd be this positive environment with all these athletes, but instead they were all doing a lot of drugs and drinking, and it was kind of a very bad environment. But I realized, hey, I love that comedy that I used to do on the street corner. So I started focusing on, focusing on comedy. I decided my next thing that I wanted to shoot for was being on Johnny Carson. So again, I focused and focused and focused on writing jokes, worked in a lot of crappy comedy clubs. A, a few years later, I made it on to Johnny Carson. And then I had this whole career on television where I was doing my act and juggling and weird props and comedy, and then made it on a TV series. And my last long time gig, I was the announcer of The Price is Right. So I was the guy who says, come on down. <laughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> a new car. <laughs> so that was my gig. And you'd think a guy in show business and on TV would be really, really rich and successful, but it was actually a pretty rough living because it was so scattered and the long gaps between gigs. So averaged out, even though it looked like I was doing big things and had a career, it was, it was actually, I was struggling most of the time and living on credit cards. So what happened was the price is right was my like one long, long, long time gig and that enabled me to buy this messed up little house, which I slowly started to fix up. And I, but I was so proud of that little house, even though it was messed up, I was proud of it because I finally felt like a success after all these years. And, um, and then what happened was, uh, overnight a bank error messed up my credit and overnight. And it was a bank error. It wasn't fault of my own. And I almost lost my house. I almost went bankrupt. I almost lost everything. And it was devastating. And I was broke because I, be between gigs again, you know, Crisis Right would have these hiatuses. And, and I was too broke to hire a credit repair company. So I set out to learn everything I could about credit. And then I started that focus again, that obsession to where that's all I thought about. And I ended up fixing my own credit. And then I started helping family and friends. And then I thought, oh, hey, I could make a living at this. Because at this point, I was on the road also doing my act as well. And I was so tired of this life. I had done it for so many years. Um, I wanted to have a home life. And so I thought, okay, this is my way out of show business. I, I could start a credit repair business. But the only problem was it was so time consuming, keeping track of everything and writing all the letters and keeping track of the little scraps of paper and all the notes of the calls. And it was too much. And so I, I realized this is really repetitive work. Uh, there, there must be software for this. So I started searching for it and then I, I couldn't find any. So then I thought, aha, I found my way out of show business. I'm going to create the world's first credit repair software. But I had no idea about creating software or running a business. I, I didn't go to school for this stuff. I didn't go to college for finance. I, I didn't even graduate high school. So I just started studying and studying and obsessing again. And it took me about three years to I, uh, learning different programming languages. And then I'd get a few months into it and I'd realize this isn't going to do what I wanted to do. And then I'd start learning another and another. And then finally realized this is wasting time. And for some reason, a light bulb went off that said, hire somebody who knows how to do this. So I hired a programmer. And slowly he helped me make this little tiny download that was called Credit Aid Software. And I would sell it for $29 and it actually worked. And it would do what it was supposed to do and people started buying it. Um, and in a good week I could make $80. <laughs> it, was a, it was a terrible, terrible business. Um, <laughs> So after all this struggling for years, that's all I had. And it wasn't my way out of show business. And then I had this vision that this was going to be this big infomercial product. I remember the guy with all the question marks all over him. Yeah. Um, uh, Matthew Lesko. Yeah. That's who I wanted to be. I wanted to be the credit <laughs> doctor and have infomercials and stuff and have this whole thing aimed at consumers. Um, but consumers didn't want to buy it. It was just a nightmare. And I didn't know what to do. Um, but then a really interesting thing happened. I started hearing from mortgage brokers and realtors and credit repair companies, and they all started asking for bigger versions to help their clients. 
And that's when I thought, aha, this is supposed to be a business software. Uh, and, and people weren't saying the cloud back then, um, but they'd call it hosted online. So I, I realized I need to build this thing as a SaaS software. People didn't even say SaaS back then, but it was no, that, yeah. a, a software hosted online. I thought that's going to take a lot of money. I'm still broke. Um, so I started meeting with investors one by one and they all said no. So I just, I again, obsessed and obsessed and obsessed. And that's all I could think about. And I sat in a room and I didn't bathe and I didn't hardly ate. I didn't shave. I didn't get haircuts. I was just like a freak in this room, just obsessing and obsessing and drawing it over and over again. So, cause I didn't know how to make it. Uh, and I didn't realize I was making wireframes. Um, and I just kept obsessing and obsessing. And I said, I'm not going to leave this room until I figure it out. And about three hours later, I launched Credit Repair Cloud, started getting some early traction. Um, and it made a, a good amount. In the first year, it made a quarter of a million dollars. Um, it's made about, oh, a little more than two, it made a little more than, than double that the second year. But I was playing all the roles myself. I was Phil on sales. I was Tammy on support. <laughs> I was pretending to be all these people and, <laughs> and working crazy hours. Uh -huh. And it wasn't, am I going off on too much of a tangent? You're doing, doing great. Good? Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> okay. <I love> it. <laughs> so I was Phil on sales as Tammy on support. And everyone hated Tammy. Um, <laughs> we'd get support tickets that said Tammy's a bitch. <laughs> and I knew I needed help. I didn't know uh -huh. how to get help. I didn't know anything about really creating the company. Um, and then I got lucky. Google had this thing they released. They only promoted it one day. It was called Google Helpouts. And it was right below the search window. It said, check out Google Helpouts. And I clicked on it and it was like this menu of, uh, of people that could help you. You could get an attorney or a yoga instructor, or if you're trying to learn how to play Stairway to Heaven, on the guitar, there'd be this long haired rocker dude who'd go, no dude, hold your hand like this when you're playing Sarah F. Anyways, I thought this is far out. Google's trying to connect people. And I thought, well, what do I need? Um, I wasn't thinking about the business. I was thinking, my only question was, how do you format bullet points in an email on a Mac? Cause I just bought my first Mac. And I start scrolling around looking for somebody to help me with this. Cause I just wanted to try out the service. And I kept seeing this, little kid in a suit in a tie and um i kept scrolling through other people but i kept going back to him and i don't know what drew me to him uh his name's keenan uh i ended up uh, keenan charged four dollars and 95 cents for 15 minutes to do sort of it support and i could tell he was like in high school so i figured he was about 17 and i started obsessing about him and looked up his resume and saw he was still in high school uh, and then his resume said he'd been doing IT support for 10 years. So I thought, wow, he started at seven. I got to meet yeah. Keenan. I keep going in the other room to tell my girlfriend. She's going, what are you doing? Aren't we going to watch a show? And I kept going, no, I have to meet Keenan. And five minutes later, I'm face to face with Keenan. And he solved my problem in about a minute. And I said, wow, you're really good at this. Uh, let me tell you about me because I'd like you to work for me. Um, and, and I told him, and, and he started being our first support person, so I could fire Tammy, the bitch. Yeah, good, good, good. <laughs> I need to get rid of her. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so he started doing amazing at the support. Everyone loved Keenan. But then a few months later, he started giving me advice. And I thought, why is this kid giving me advice? And then a few more months went by, and I started following the advice, and we started making a lot more money. Um, Keenan now runs everything. Um, Keenan worked his way up and he started getting me to hire people and I, I, we now have a massive team. We now have 60 people. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's, we, he got me to start hiring people. Then he got me to start paying attention to what other companies were doing. We started following Russell Brunson, um, and click funnels and the whole funnel hacker community. And um, we got involved there. We got in Russell's inner circle. Uh, we started following Alex Sharfin, and who helped us put together a structure for our business. 
And now Keenan has gone from being the support person number one to being vice president. And now we have this massive team. And um, it's been a really, really, really fun ride. This is why I'm so excited. But here's the, the main thing he got me to do when I started following Russell Brunson. The business was doing well and we were making good money. But what set it on fire was the creating a movement. Okay, that this shirt I'm wearing says Credit Hero, which a lot of people ask if it's the name of the company, but no, the company's Credit Repair Cloud, but this is the name of our avatar. This is our, our customer. And so we help them to become credit heroes so they can go out and change lives. So that's the basis for the movement we've grown. And so that should be key here since we're talking about influencers. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we, and we're going to talk more about that. Um, you you have an amazing story, and you're an amazing storyteller. And I, I want to go back because you touched on a lot of things that are really interesting um, for the podcast and I think for our listeners. But uh, was was Keenan, Keenan right? Keenan, yes. Was he really 17? Yes. Yes, he was. Okay. <laughs> How <laughs> yeah, old is he now? Young Yoda. He's How now is... 25. I think he just turned 25. 25. Good career for him. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so you, where did you grow up at? Were you? In... I grew up in Los Angeles. Did you? Okay. Yeah. So you're literally, you left home at 13 years old. Yes. And what was that like for you being a young teenager? Do you think that helped propel you into the, the man that you are today to get you into the career that you created? What was your experience like? Oh, absolutely. Because I had to learn everything. I mean, I was thrust into... First, working on the streets, I had to make enough to eat, and then I had to make enough to get off the streets. And then in show business, in order to work, get get further ahead, you have to make yourself look cool. So I started having to learn video editing and all these other tools. Basically, um, plus the, the 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 skill of making things look cooler than they are, then working backwards to make them real, and. Um, so this is all show business and even everything I'm doing now, even though I didn't go to business school and I didn't go to, I didn't go to school for any of what I'm doing. I just study a lot and I use everything that I've ever learned. So I'm totally using show business in everything that I do here. I could tell on your videos, you've got some good videos in marketing. I was like, yeah, he's, oh, thanks. He, he got that from show business. So we went from growing up and then living on the streets, juggling um, and, and being broke for many years. Uh, and going through close to bankruptcy. Um, I, I had many years as an entrepreneur also when I was just getting by, pay, you know, not even paycheck to paycheck sometimes, like, you know, figuring out how to do it and not have any money for rent and this this as well. Um, can you share about that experience and, and maybe some of the key lessons you learned from, from many years of that? Initially, in the early days of the business, well, for one thing, I didn't have any money, so I had to build it from nothing. So I, I got a, a book that really helped me was Bootstrap by the guys who wrote, uh, the guys who created Basecamp. Okay, um, yeah. Yeah, and that really inspired me uh, to just build something from nothing. Every dollar would go back into it, but it just uh, enabled me to, to, to just scrape it together. It takes a long time, but it makes you very, very smart with every penny. And, um, but the other thing was that, that I came to learn after some, after it started to get some traction was spending money is important. I, initially I tried to run it all on free stuff and free stuff can only get you so far. And, it's really important. Like I, it's important to spend money when you do start to have it. And a lot of people are afraid of that. Like those videos you saw, we spend a fortune now on videos, um, but it pays off. It's, it's worthwhile to spend the money in the right things. But the, I was throwing away a lot of money um, on the wrong things first, because I, I didn't have clarity on who our avatar was and what our business was and what our movement was. Um, and so it was all over the place for a long time. And then because for the longest time I thought, oh, I know better than anybody. So I'm not going to talk to anybody and I'm just going to pave my own path. 
And that's really hard and that usually doesn't work. But what Keenan got me to see was modeling. And we started modeling other businesses. We started modeling click funnels very, very closely. And, and the modeling, suddenly it's not a gamble anymore to spend money because you can see what it did for the other company. Not, not copying someone's business, but copying, copying their strategy. Yeah, nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Yeah. So then we go into the time where, okay, you got into television. Yes. And, um, and you spent quite a few years on The Price is Right. And then um, what, was, what were some of the key takeaways, I, I, I think, from your years in the television business? Because you were there a couple of decades. Yeah, as a kid, I always thought the way to get rich is by making money while you sleep. Somebody had said that to me when I was very, very young and I was fascinated by that. And so I kept thinking, uh, I'm gonna write a show or create a show or produce a show and that's gonna have those residuals. But that's a big fantasy in show business. It never really works out. Uh, other people always make all the money. Um, <laughs> so there's, I mean, after 30 years in it, I just finally realized this is insane because I'm never going to have this dream. I'm never going to have financial freedom. Someone else will all, always be calling the shots. And that's when I knew I had to create my, uh, my own thing. As well, I was, I was getting older. I was in my 40s at that point. I'm 56 now. But I was in my 40s and it was looking pretty scary that I was going to ha still have this haphazard career, not be able to hang, hang on to a girlfriend or, or, or just have a normal life. And um, so I, I just, I wanted to figure out how to make money while during my sleep. And I, and I wanted to call the shots and have my own thing. And what's interesting, not only do I have the money while I sleep part now, but our business, Credit Repair Cloud, we're actually giving people a turnkey business that they run. It's their business. It's not MLM, but it's the software platform for that business. All they have to do is add clients. And then they've got their own recurring revenue business because it takes many months to repair someone's credit. So you get the client paying you every single month. And that's why we have customers who are now making millions of dollars. So that, that takes me to the next question. What was that, that banking error that made you go near bankrupt? Oh, oh, this was the most stupid thing. Um, so I buy this messed up house. I had two loans. I've had big loan and a little loan, that home equity line of credit, um, which is really a revolving line of credit, like a credit card. And some idiot at the bank put them both at the same amount. So it looked on my credit reports like I was hundreds of thousands of dollars over a revolving <laughs> line of credit, which oh instantly gosh. set up red flags on all my other accounts. They all went up to like 30%. I don't think they're allowed to charge that percentage anymore, but back then they could. And so all my credit card bills, which were high from fixing up my little weird house, uh, they all doubled overnight and I couldn't oh afford it. Oh my gosh, Yeah, wow. and I called the bank and they said, oh, sorry, we made a mistake, but we'll fix it. But they couldn't fix the whole domino effect on all my cards. And so it was just really, really crazy. So- um, What year was this? That was around 2002. Yeah, but then it was a struggle of years until it led to the very first download. This is, I'm a very slow entrepreneur. <laughs> it took many, many years. Well, it does sometimes, you know, it's just the process of becoming, I was, uh, uh, spent too much money on my first business and then the recession hit in 2008 and, and wiped me out. So I had no revenue coming in and I couldn't afford anything went near, I didn't file for bankruptcy, but I was close, uh, and to the point where I was eating like corn and green beans for breakfast and, <laughs> and donating plasma so I could have gas money, you know, one car got repoed. Uh, but before that, the couple of years before that, it was prosperous, you know, and I bought a new sports car and everything. And, and afterwards it's, I was in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so it hit us pretty hard and that's, that's all, that's a hard lesson to learn, you know, going through, through, through that. I'm curious, what, 
what are some takeaways, uh, really important takeaways that you got out of that experience? For me, it was like, you know, I've got to manage my money. I've got to manage revenue. I've got to re- manage expenses. And I've got to, I've got to be wise enough to um, see the next three to five years of the business at least um, and it, pay attention to economy, the economy as well. Oh, so yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm curious, like, what are some of the lessons that you took from that? Well, it's interesting. You mentioned the bad economy. That was 2008 to 2000 and th- the end of 2012 were the worst years. And 2008 is when I set out to start Credit Repair Cloud, but I didn't launch it until 2013. All those years I was in this weird little room and trying to bootstrap this big SaaS software. And yeah, it was really just finding a way to use every penny wisely, but at the same time, the, the, the people I knew were getting these 2% loans on their houses. And I, I made a mistake of calling the bank to, to find out if there was a program like that for me. And what happened was it put me on the ugly list. And I, I ended up not wanting, they, they said, oh, we can help you. We can lower, we can give you a 2% loan like your friends you're talking about. But in order to do that, you have to stop paying your mortgage because uh, we can't help you unless you, you fall behind. And I said, I don't want to fall behind. I'll, I'll mess up my credit. They said, oh, you just have to miss a payment or two. And then we, and, and they were encouraging me to mess up my credit. <laughs> yeah, it was really like I was on a cliff and they wanted to push me off. And, and I, there wasn't money to pay the mortgage or all the other bills and, I just hustled and I made people websites and I did whatever I could to just keep that dream going. And those were a lot of years and many days I was so depressed, I couldn't get out of bed because it didn't look like it was going to work out. And it looked like I was just on the verge of losing everything. And that was a lot of years and it was really, really rough. And I just kept thinking if I just keep building this thing and keep building this thing, I'll be in the right place at the right time. This bad economy has got to end. And, and right just about to the month that I launched it, the, the economy got better and started to take off. And so did the business. And, but an interesting, here was an interesting thing. Um, I was listening, wait, who was talking about this? Was it Ezra? Um, about not worrying about SEO. I think it was on your show. Um, I may be wrong. But a lot of people, uh, here's one takeaway for my business. I didn't have any money to advertise. So I thought, what am I going to do? And then I just thought, well, I don't know what to do. So I'll just keep writing. And I wrote every night, every night, all night long. And I started creating this massive amount of text out there that ended up becoming a fishing net. That's a big takeaway because I didn't have money for advertising. And it took a long time for that content to start paying off. But now we don't even need to advertise. We get, um, oh, I think we get about 200,000 visits to our site every month. And it, most of it is just from all the articles that we've that written. you were right. Yeah. So yeah. that's another big takeaway from not having any money. Yeah. <laughs> but now instead of me writing all night, now we have a whole team of writers. That's good. Yeah. Is it, is it the, who was the girl? Tanya? Is it, no. Who was your support lady? Tan, Tan? Oh, Tammy. <laughs> Tammy. <Yeah. laughs> was she the one writing the letters? She was. She was a terrible writer. <laughs> um, okay. So, so now we're moving into, to creating the business and the years that you were saying, you know, hanging out in your room, writing and, and mapping out the ideas. Um, you know, what was that drive for you during that time? Because, you know, you, you've said you've always been really laser focused and just soak up one thing at a time. Um, what was, what do you think that, that passion and that drive for you was that could keep you fear. in one spot? Fear. Massive fear, which I, even though we're now an eight figure business, I still wake up every morning with massive fear, but I use it because it, lights a fire under my ass every morning. But it was fear because I couldn't go back to show business. Um, I couldn't go back to going and doing my act on the road. I mean, sure, the crisis right was a good gig, but it wasn't solid. I still had to go do my act on the road. I was on cruise ships. I was stuck in hotel rooms, which sounds really glamorous, but after 30 years of that, it's not. 
it's not uh, yeah. no no not at all and i could not go back to that by by that point i was rusty on my act um i gained all this weight from from just being obsessed over the business and not moving not leaving that room uh and and treating myself very badly and not sleeping and so i I was beyond the point of no return. I had to keep, even though the business wasn't working, I had to keep working through it because I had no alternative. It was sink or swim. Right. So I kept swimming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. As best as possible. Yeah. And, and Okay. And then you launched it in 2013, correct? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and it, it started to do well, um, but it wasn't, setting anything on fire until we started creating a movement. Okay. Yeah. And, and so how long from like 2013 until you started to create a movement? I think that started in 2016. Yeah. Okay. The beginnings of it, maybe 15, 16. Yeah. I was hiding my background, by the way. I was hiding my, Oh, you weren't telling I, people. Yeah, all okay. my old show business pages I had taken down because I thought no one's going to trust me. I don't look like a financial expert. And, and every little bit of me from the past, I, I removed and hid. Um, Cause I was thinking if they find out I was a street juggler and I did all these comedy <laughs> and how are they going to trust me to run their business on my financial software? Um, but what's interesting was in putting together the movement, the movement needed a leader and the leader needed a story and and i freaked out because i thought i can't talk about my past and then i realized wait a minute i did all these weird things i w didn't set out to to be in finances or credit or anything like that i don't have a degree in economics or finance i didn't graduate high school and hey that's kind of a lot like our own customers Many of them didn't go to college. No one sets out to do a lot of things that they end up doing. And the interesting thing was, if I could become an expert by just obsessing over this new thing, so could they. And suddenly it all connected together. Yeah, I think I figured that out as we were preparing for our first event. We do this massive event every year called Credit Repair Expo. And it was in preparing for that. And that's when we also realized the credit hero persona that we created for our customers and that seemed to strike a chord and then i started talking about how we change lives and and credit had this really bad stigma uh it was kind of sketchy and done in the dark and we shined a light on it and made it legal and good and 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 about really really helping people and i think because it comes from a good place and a, 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 from the heart people started to be drawn to it. And that was the start of the movement. So you mentioned something that, you know, we're talking about influencer influences, influencing. And, um, and you also mentioned that you kind of followed Russell yes. Brunson's motto and believe it or not, like at my desk, I have the book right here <laughs> and you do too. That yes. One somewhere. <laughs> it's here as well. Yeah. Dot yeah. com secrets and, and expert secrets. Yes, and and both are great books because um, they they really uh, Russell in both books um, dumbs it down to layman terms on how anybody uh, can create really great business models. And you talked about you know your movement didn't have a leader, right. and then it started to shift when it, it had a leader. And this is basic stuff that you learn in dot com secrets and expert exactly. secrets. Exactly. So, so when you decided to become a leader, can you talk about like what happened? Uh, what did you start to do personally? And then what happened with the business? I started to tell my story instead of hiding it. And people loved it. I thought they were going to hate it and attack me. And instead they loved it. And it just started to grow. And, and another thing, I mean, when you write a book, it makes you the expert. So uh, like Russell, I wrote a book. What's your book called? It's um, The Ultimate Guide to Starting a Credit Repair Business. Oh, nice. Okay. And so just like um, the way Russell uh, gives away his books for free on online, we started giving our book away for free. And having the book made me the expert 
because that you can't dispute someone wrote the book. <laughs> of course um, not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then that pulls them into our world. And then we just guide them up our value ladder. And and how's your value ladder created? Well, like, what, what does it look like? They, they get our book for free and, or they listen, they, they will soon listen to my podcast that's about to launch. It's called Credit Repair Business Secrets. And then that sort of pulls, pulls them into our world. And if we can deliver value by giving them something for free that we might even lose money on to give it to them, uh, if it shows value, they're going to trust us. And then they might want to spend a little bit of money. They might buy a very inexpensive course. We have courses in credit disputing and how to build your business and all that kind of stuff. And we, they're not big money makers. We, we have them priced very, very affordably so that the lower, the people just getting started can afford them. And then if we deliver value on that, then they're going to try the next thing, which is going to be our software. And the software is priced very affordably. Um, if you just have two paid clients, it covers your cost of the software and all the rest is profit. And I, ideally, it's our job uh, to make them as successful as we can in running their business because then they'll need the software. If you don't have the business and don't have clients, you won't need the software. So we want to make them very, very, very successful. And like you mentioned earlier, in the last year and a half, 25 people have made over a million dollars in this software just by following these same principles. And uh, we're preparing for our next event and we've just discovered 12 more. So wow, 37. Uh, nice. Yeah, there'll be 37 in two years. Did you say 25 people in the past year and a half? Yes. Wow, that's amazing. And so at our big event, we have this thing that's like the Academy Awards of Credit. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is where we use all the showbiz stuff. Yeah, great. And they all yeah. come on and get their big awards. And then we have little awards on our wall of our office as well. So it's really cool. And then it makes for great videos because I can, each each one on the wall, I can tell a story about. Do you give away a free car? Um, to affiliates. To affiliates? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the way to get 100 it. people signed up for Credit Repair Cloud and we cover your car payment. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I love it, man. And okay, so so you started um, telling your story uh, around, is it, you know, you launched in 2013. I think you it was started about telling you. 2016 or 2017, somewhere in there, I started really, really working on the story. And, and what are some ways that you just, you spread your story? What are some ways that you told it? Facebook lives, writing, blog articles, um, in, in the book. Um, oh, in our webinar. Um, yeah, in our webinar, it, it, I think that's maybe even where I first started telling this. This is a webinar that sells one of our bigger coaching programs. It's called the Masterclass. Um, and we have this free training webinar, and, and that's where I really go into my story, and I also tell the story of our customers. And it's so much more compelling when you're telling stories that people can relate to. Do you keep base, the basic same story script? Or like I find myself when I tell my story, I always want to add, because I'm always learning new stuff, you know, and I want to add, and I want to add, and I want to, you know, tell this other story that I hadn't told before. Do you keep the same script, or do you change it up as, as you go per audience or oh i change it up i mean i don't change the story but sometimes i go more and more into how scary it was when the finances are were bad sometimes i talk about what it was like being on the streets as a kid um there's always different routes to go with it depending on what i'm talking about but um yeah but now i'm even more excited telling other people's stories Oh yeah. And that's a good selling point too. Like, you know, you're, you're giving your own testimonials by telling other people's stories, right? Exactly. Like we have a, there's a girl named Ashley Maskingill who uses our software. She was working at the post office and she, her credit got messed up just like mine. And she started fixing her credit and her score started going up and she started posting on Facebook that her score was going up. And suddenly all of her Facebook friends wanted help with their credit. And she ended up building this business. And in 18 months, 
of, of, of leaving the post office and starting her business, she'd made over a million dollars. And she was able to quit the post office from this business and her husband was able to retire. Now they travel uh, <laughs> and it all from running this business. Anyways, I just love telling these various stories and, and it's just a lot of fun and it really is showbiz. So let's talk more about the software yeah. in, in specific, because, you know, I'm curious, a, a lot of people that do, you know, buy something that helps them start a business, either the support's not there or they don't have the habits down um, or they don't have the, the know-how to continue to grow a business or, you know, there's a lot of things. So I'm, I'm curious, like, what are, what's some of the structure that you uh, help uh, continue, uh, you help the people that are using the software grow their business over time? Well, this is an interesting thing. If you're selling to people, who uh, a product to run a business, a lot of people, for, first of all, they come to us and they don't know anything about the business that they want to start, which is really odd. Um, and the people who are driven like I was, they do really well. But there are a lot of people who are just dabblers. They're not doers, they're just dabblers. And it's really hard to wrangle those people. We 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 keep adding more and more support people because I really believe support is everything. And we answer all their questions. We have this Facebook community and we're very live in there answering questions. But some people just need more and more handholding. So then we started having free software classes and we do that every day. But occasionally you'll get people that complain um, that it's not working for them, but then I look and they're not using the tools. They're not logging in, they're not doing anything. And there's an interesting quote from Russell where Russell says, uh, oh, in fact, he's talking about the Coast Guard when they go out to save people who are drowning, like a, a boat capsizes or something and people are flailing around in the water and they've got the helicopter and they can only save so many people. And, what they do is they, they focus on the people swimming towards them. And that's what we do. We focus on the people swimming towards us because they really want it the most. And so that's where we put the most of our effort. And I don't know if I'm really answering I think your so. question. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's, it's really getting them to swim our direction and doing as many, many different things as we can. Finding the, the right people that are swimming your direction, yes. which happens like if, if, if there's listeners out there that don't understand that, it's like um, you're always going to have people that are much more motivated and much more committed to whatever educational program or, or that you have set up. Right. And you're going to have some folks that just aren't. And that's just the nature of, of the sure. business, you know, and like like if somebody reads a book. There's a, there's a certain percentage that will take action on the book, and there's a certain percentage that will not. So you guys, I'm sure, would have to create the structure around the people that are taking action right. as much as possible and support them. In turn, that creates more people that will come in and take action, you know, and more and more, and then more people will come. And and some people won't, and that's okay. They, they have some other thing they can work on, you know. Absolutely. One thing we're doing to counteract that, um, and we're frantically working to finish it. It should be ready before March because we want to launch March 1st is we're building a challenge. And, and I really think this is going to be the thing because it totally immerses people and it pulls them really hard by the hand. And they, if, they're, if they're excited about it at all, it's going to drag them through and get them to get their wow moments. Uh, so then they'll, they'll have success. And when they have success and they convert, and then we've got a customer for life. It's just getting them to those wow moments. That's the really hard part, but I'm really excited that this is going to work. Yeah, that, that sparks more passion and more inspiration, right? If you yes. can get them there. Um, okay, so take us more into the software and what it, what it does actually for people that you know, are looking to repair credit or looking to start a business to, to help others repair credit. Sure. Um, what this is, it's essentially a CRM, but it does all these magical things with the credit. Um, so basically, it, it runs every part of your business. You can charge clients. You can have affiliates sending you clients. 
it, it uh, keeps track of all those transactions. But then with the credit stuff, it imports credit reports and then it, it highlights all the issues. It, it makes it, uh, the way credit repair works is 79% of the population have errors on their credit reports. So nearly eight out of 10 people have errors and that are affecting their score. And all you have to do to remove those errors is send one letter and the score goes up. And then there are other tricks of uh, paying down your credit cards to a certain balance and, and not closing old accounts and uh, a zillion other things. Um, and then there's accurate items that are on credit re reports as well. And those can also be removed if you attack them the right way and write the right letter and find there's usually some error in what's being reported, um, even as little as having a wrong address or a wrong uh, date or different things can be removed for all those reasons. So our software, basically you, you have a, a potential client and um, let's say they come to you from your website or a referral. They appear as a lead in credit repair cloud. It's very, uh, friendly interface kind of looks a little like Facebook. It almost looks like you've got a little friend message. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. I saw that. And then you can, um, you can get that customer to sign up from their mobile phone. They can get their credit monitoring, which gives them a credit report. And with one click, it imports in the software and then it creates instantly this, this uh, audit report. It's kind of like when you take your car into the dealership and then they tell you, they print you a report to show you all the things wrong with their car and what they can do to help. And it makes it very transparent what you're doing there at the dealership. We do the same thing where our customers can show their clients this amazing audit report all about their credit. So the customer can learn what's going on and what uh, our software user can do to fix the issue. And it even tells things that the customer can do to speed up the process, things they can do to improve it on their end. And it makes it really, really transparent. So there's no mystery what's happening. And, um, and it really delivers value. And we encourage our customers to do this as a free service. And then just reading through that audit report converts that client generally, uh, converts them into a client. And, and then once they're, once you've imported the report, the software analyzes it, finds all the issues wrong, and then you tag them and you decide with the client which you're going to dispute and why, then it stores all of that. Maybe it takes 10 or 15 minutes that first time. It stores all of that. and You've basically stored the entire life cycle of that client. So then you don't want to send too many letters every month or the credit bureaus are going to flag you as frivolous. So you want to dispute a handful of items each month. So that's why this takes months because um, you're just doing a few at a time, but the actual work of it, it just takes a few minutes per month per client, usually less than five minutes per client once they're all set up. So it makes it very easy for having a recurring revenue business where all you have to do is be awesome, get more clients, and your revenue starts to grow because they're paying you every single month. You just deliver value, get more clients, be awesome. <laughs> Lather, rinse, repeat. <laughs> so, I like that. <laughs> yeah. So I'm having fun really teaching people the business and teaching them simplicity. That's the hard part. They get so dazzled by shiny objects you know, that you have to have the fanciest website or, you know, trying to, to make everything perfect. And uh, that's one thing I've learned through this process is trying to get things perfect is such a waste of time. And then you just go in circles. There's a saying, um, but, uh, done is better than perfect because perfect never gets done. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, it's a little like Russell's ready, fire, aim, ready, fire, aim. Yeah. yeah. Which I love. How do you, you apply that in like, if you're, if you're working on a project, you've got podcasts coming out, you've got some new promotion coming out. Um, and you know, when you, when you recognize that you and the team are getting wrapped up in perfection as opposed to application and what are some things that you recognize 
uh, when that's happening and how do you shift um, from going, okay, I'm just going to release this. We're going to release this. We're going to make sure it's going out now. Well, <laughs> we don't get wrapped up in that anymore because I keep an eye on it. Um, and I, and I don't want to fall victim to that ever again. Um, but it's funny, we're doing this challenge and the fellow who's writing all the content is this amazing guy named Corey Gray. And Corey also had a business doing credit repair, it grew it from nothing, ended up selling it for a whole lot of money and wanted something to do. I said, come create content for us. And, and he's great. And, but he's a perfectionist and he's the one who keeps wanting to make things perfect. So I have to keep on him. We had a meeting about the challenge. He's going, well, we can go back and fix these later. And I go, we're not going to fix them. <laughs> we're going to be on to the next thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, we usually nail it pretty well. Um, yeah. I mean, we, we nail it pretty well, but we just keep pushing forward because it just has to keep moving forward. What are, what are some boundaries, though, like other entrepreneurs can give for themselves to, to stop them from over, uh, being over per Per, be an over perfectionist. Just stop. <laughs> just stop. <laughs> just just stop. look at how you're going in circles. And if you have a team, create it part of your your structure with your goals, and and just drum that into your team. You know. Okay. Yeah. Just keep it. Do a great job, but keep moving forward so we can get on to the next thing. I mean, just following this principle, we accomplish so much more. Yeah, I'm whereas like in the early days, I would think, oh God, if I just move this button a little this way or this way, or maybe I change the color of and none of that matters. Right. Just push it out there. Because once it's out there, you, there are gonna be mistakes and then you can adjust. You know, and I think what's really key, and I've seen this so many times, is like people telling your story and being out there sharing your story is more important than those minute details because I've seen so many people that are just so great at telling their story and they get a massive following and you look at their their website or their podcast or whatever and you're kind of like whoa that that part hasn't caught up yet you know because they're but they're focused on that and it doesn't matter because you know people are following them anyway and and the rest can catch up when it catches up absolutely so it's a really good point. I have that challenge uh, more than I would like to admit about over perfection. Um, but uh, yeah, so 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 do a lot of people, I think. Yeah, it's a tough one. Do you have any like good credit hacks that you can share with the listeners? Yeah. Okay. If you want to bump up your credit, like let's say you're going to buy a house and if you can bump up your credit just a little bit, you're going to get a better rate. So like three months before buying that house, um, you'd want to stop paying, you, stop using your credit cards. You want to immediately, but let's say you're not even buying a house. Uh, you just want to bump up your credit, pay down your credit cards to below 30% of the available credit line. Cause when they're maxed out, that sends off red flags. It looks like you're in trouble. So the more available credit you have, the better you look to the, to the credit bureaus and the algorithm. So that's going to bump up the score. So you pay your cards down to below 30%. But then the important thing is don't ever spend more than that available than that 30% of the available credit line. Even if you pay the bill off in full every month, let's say it's a $10,000 credit line. Um, you, you still don't want to spend more than three of it because if you're spending up to, close to the limit or anywhere up here um, and then that happens to be, and you plan on, hey, I'm paying it next week by the time the bill is due. Well, you don't know when they're going to report to the bureaus and they may be reporting when it's at its highest. So the, the real hack is to pay them down to below 30 and don't spend more than that ever, even if you pull, pay it off full, in every, uh, full each month. Um, don't let anyone else use your credit cards. <laughs> don't co-sign. <laughs> Um, okay. don't co-sign for anybody. That's just a disaster. Um, don't close old credit lines because the keep older, them the, open. yeah, keep them open because that shows history and that adds to your score. And you can even keep, keep them open and cut up the, the credit cards if you don't want to use them. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Well, one thing I don't, I'm sure you probably know this, but um, along the lines of keeping it below thirty percent, you can. And I did this um, before I went through my first bankruptcy, uh-huh. close to bankruptcy, and uh, I would call the credit card companies and ask them to raise the limit. And sure. So, so that you can raise the limit and keep that that thirty percent. If you can't pay off, pay it down to thirty percent or lower. Absolutely. And, and then, and then the credit report agencies report that you're still below the 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 thirty percent. Absolutely. Correct? But when you make that call to ask them to raise the credit line, tell them, "Hey, I'm in the process of buying my house, so please do not uh, do not ding my credit." You know, do it based on my history with you as a company of being a good customer. And they very often will raise the credit line. That's the other thing. You want to not apply for credit unless you really, really need it. Because each each one dings your score as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Great suggestions. Um, I want to move on. And we talked about uh, the business and how you've created the business and everything. I think it's really great. Uh, that you've used this business model and it's worked for you. I, I really want to talk, Daniel, about um, um, either like daily rituals or daily daily schedule or routines that you have. So one thing that that I've um, noticed is like really high achievers, and I study high performance a lot, um, have you know these rituals and these schedules that can help them stay in this right state of mind to help them perform at higher levels. And so. Are you, do you happen to be a UFC fan? No. Any chance? Okay. Anyway, um, there's a fighter there that, you know, recently he went from like the low lows, his name's Conor McGregor, to just winning and dominating this fight that was really impressive. And when he, after he, he won in 40 seconds against a guy that has had more UFC wins than anybody in UFC history. And um, after the fight, uh, his family came in. And there was uh, Tony Robbins that came in with his family also. And I thought to myself, that's his secret. He's training with, you know, the top um, life coach that helps people achieve these massive and great things when no other fighter is probably doing anything like that. So I always like to ask, you know, other high performing entrepreneurs, you know, you came on with a big smile. You were excited to be here. I can tell you've got really great energy. Like what are those things that you do? Uh, maybe daily routines that keep you in that good state of mind to keep you going, going, going every single day. I'm probably going to mess this whole theory up. Because okay. <laughs> I'm not good with structure or routines. That's okay. Um, but we can learn from all. I'm good at building them for our team. I do have sort of a structure in the morning. Um, I do get up and um, I mean, I have a routine, but I'm not doing what I should be doing. I don't think I'm setting a very good example. Well, I mean, based on results, you're doing pretty amazing. So, I mean, even sharing, you know, okay, your routines that you set up for your team, you know, why you do those and what those are. That's what's working. And that's what's putting everyone into momentum. Are you familiar with Alex Sharp? i no. Oh, he's got a, he also has a great podcast called Momentum. Okay. And he helps entrepreneurs to build the structure of their business. It's all about the structure and the way the communication and goal setting happens. Um, and through his program, I should back up a little bit. One of the first things uh, he helped us to create was a client centric mission. Are you familiar with that concept? Basically focused on clients needs or. Yeah, but about our own company. And uh, when you use it, 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 it turns your team into true believers. It's the, the heart of the company and it's a document. I could read it to you. It's, it's what we base all decisions on. It's really kind of a fascinating thing. Do you want to hear about yeah, this Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's do it. Okay. And then we'll get into the, 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 the routine with the business. But, um, but basically, you create this client-centric mission, which uh, helps to remind you of who you are serving and why. And it explains, and, and it's a really simple exercise. He has us do it, and we create it in about 10 minutes. And then 10 minutes later, we have like the most important document of our whole company. And basically, it says, who do you want to help, um, how you'll help them, the change you want to make, 
in the world or, or with them and how you know you're successful. So we created ours. And let me, let me read this to you. And the interesting thing is this is a ritual because we read it. Uh, we have meetings every day. We have a morning huddle with the whole team and where we talk about um, there's, uh, what's going on, if there's any news, if there's any critical issues that are affecting our business or affecting our customers' business. And it's a very quick meeting, but we all kind of connect and it gives us all energy on the day and we all are focused on, on where we're going and everybody is, has full transparency on where the company's going. We discuss the numbers, we discuss how many customers we have, how close we are to our goals. This all happens in the morning huddle every single day. Then our weekly, quarterly, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and then annual meetings, we also read this client-centric mission. And this is really the soul of our company. And again, it's who we want to help, how we'll help them, the change we want to make, and how we'll know we're successful. So here's ours. We help entrepreneurs to help their clients with their credit, to truly change lives, and make a great living in the process. We help them by creating the software, the systems, and the strategies to grow multi-million dollar credit repair businesses from nothing. The change we want to make is to eradicate the stigma of credit repair, to take power away from the banks and bureaus, and to help as many people as we can to reach their dreams. We'll know we're successful when we are seen as the organization that can help any entrepreneur who's on a mission to help their clients with their credit, to make a huge impact in their community, and gain financial freedom. And then I added this last part, which wasn't part of the, the assignment. We will create our legacy by changing lives for our customers, their clients, our team, our families, our communities, and the world in every way we can. So that is also a ritual that we read this and it makes our team true believers. And we bring our team to our events. So then our customers are coming up to them going, you're changing my life. You're helping me change lives. And it just makes it all stronger. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. I was taking notes when you said that. That was really good. I wanna say one more thing Please. on this subject. Before all of this, I was afraid to share our numbers with our team. I was so afraid. And then Alex Sharfin said something really interesting. He said, they know how much you're making. <laughs> they know how many customers are. They can do math. Uh -huh. And the moment we started sharing everything, that's when we all moved together. Oh, wow. And that's when they became true believers. And they work so much harder because we all love it. We're all making this change in the world. Even though it's about such a weird thing as credit, it really is making an impact. And that's that's why I'm excited and that's what gets me up every morning. I really like that. Do you do you share your numbers with your clients and customers as well? We're starting to. You're starting to, okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna make I'm gonna talk about that a lot in my podcast. Oh good. And 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 uh, yeah, yeah we do. Yeah. I think you know we, we're so many people are so afraid of sharing numbers and being transparent with their business, but, but, you know, cause we're afraid really of not looking good. And, and then what happens is when we do that is it, people trust you more. Um, they want to do business with you more. People want to help you out more and they make subtle suggestions that can really, you know, transform everything that you do. Like if there's any entrepreneur that's out there, uh, that is not sharing their numbers, you need at least one person in your life. You share your numbers with at least, yeah. preferably more, get a little small tribe, maybe four or five people until you get comfortable with sharing it more and more and more. And, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very healthy exercise. And I think business will start to move towards more trans to, towards more transparency in governments as well. Eventually I hope. Uh, yeah. so it's so, a good thing. Yeah. It's a very good thing. And yeah, people are so afraid or our, our customers, they're so afraid to share their numbers with their team because they think their team members are going to steal their business. But there's so much more to a business. It's the execution. Nobody can steal that. Yeah. And there's so many people that are just naturally out there that, that are meant to be um, a, a part of the movement, you know, supporting a movement um, with somebody like yourself being the leader of the movement. And they're really comfortable in that position. And, and so everybody plays their role, right? Yeah.
absolutely. But I'm also having a, a blast in helping other people in our company shine and, 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 and becoming stars on their own and, 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 and as well as making our customers into stars. Yeah. What, yeah. what are some ways that you're doing that, helping some of your, some other people shine, you know, and, and grow their business? Well, with our customers having just having that Millionaires Club award, very much like ClickFunnels and their Two Comma Club, um, they start uh, having that award in pictures everywhere and in their videos, and suddenly everyone's coming to them. Um, you know, people they become uh, mentors to other people, and they start these uh, other businesses, inspiring people to be as successful as them. And it's been really, really fascinating because the same thing we saw with ClickFunnels is happening for us. And we chuckle because we, Keenan and I, because we study ClickFunnels so much and then we see the same thing happening for us and it's just so cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so that, and, and, and also spotting who's going to be awesome to speak at our next event and, and helping them uh, to come up with the ideas of what that talk is going to be. And it just, it, it reminds me of, it's, it's all show business. It reminds me of, I get to run the studio and, 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 and develop stars. It's kind of like that. <laughs> you, you've got to do something. There's something you do on a, uh, on a regular basis, whether you know it or not, that keeps you happy and motivated. So, so. I listen to a lot of podcasts. It's I would good. say that's a, <laughs> that's a habit. Good. Any, any podcasts out there you recommend? What are your favorite? Um, I really like yours. I got Thank you. into listening to yours in the last week when I knew this was coming up. It's really, really cool. Um, and of course, like I mentioned earlier, earlier uh, Alex Sharfin with the Momentum podcast. It's very, very good. Um, I listen to all of Russell's stuff. Those keep me busy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I only have a 10 block commute here to our building. So I listen to I cram those in uh, to and from. Excellent. Let's see. What else do we want to talk about? Uh, we touched on that, 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 that. How about building a team? Yeah. Let's talk about building a team. Yeah. Because this is something our customers face. And I bet a lot of your listeners face this. It's very, very hard to go from one person to a team. And when you're, especially when you're, you, you get addicted to the drama of doing everything and putting out all the fires. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's really hard, but the most, I don't think we started to grow until we, uh, uh, we didn't start to grow rapidly until I started learning how to, <laughs> it's funny when I was still doing everything. And even though I'd hired Keenan and, and he got me to start hiring other people, I was still in the support tickets and he'd go get out of the support tickets. And I was like, so into the drama. It was like, I, I'm supposed to be the captain of the ship, but I'm downstairs rowing. And so I couldn't see where we were going. And when I finally, that's another big part of the, the Sharfin program we got in with Alex Sharfin is his goal is to help the CEO to offload everything. So immediately when you get into his program, you start doing these time studies, which is, is a very strange thing. Have you ever done a time study? Uh -uh, tell me Every about it. Every 15 minutes you write down what you're doing. Yes. No yes, matter actually. what it is. And <laughs> so I haven't heard that term. So it's funny you say that. I, we're releasing a course in two weeks that's exactly on that. Oh, cool. And yes. And I've used that for years and years and years and years. And uh, yeah, it's ironic you said, but I've never heard the term time study. So go ahead. Well, what he says, has you really pay attention to what you're doing every minute? So in 15 minute increments, and it's either, it's either self-care, family time, tactical or strategic. Okay, so if you're the CEO, you, you should be doing self-care and family time. Don't be a weirdo like I was, but you should also be doing strategic. You want to be doing as much as you can of strategic and not the tactical. The tactical is being down below rowing. It's answering support tickets when you're the CEO. So the goal of the Sharfin program, one of them is to do the time study and then see what you can offload to other people. And so I started offloading everything. It was really scary at first, but I had no choice because I, this all, the, the intense work and focus and obsession started to affect my health. And so I just needed to start offloading. Plus I just 
The goal is to, for me to be in the future. So I've offloaded everything. The only thing I've kept is I like to do video editing, so editing, so I do some of that. But I pretty much offloaded everything onto other people, which allows me now to live in the future. So I can see where we're going in a year, in five years, in 10 years. And so I've been able to plot our whole road to 100 million and beyond. Um, and I know we'll get there. And it gives me, now I'm trying to help Keenan, who's now the vice president, to offload everything, because now he's the bottleneck in the company. And it's just so freeing, and it's been such a great thing. Uh, at first, when I got everything offloaded off my plate, then I didn't know what to do. And I actually started to get depressed, and I'd come into work, and I'd sort of pretend like I was working, but I'd really be playing on Facebook because I didn't know what to do. But then I started really getting into the meetings, and, and then I started to feel that daily momentum that, that we crave. I started feeling it from the team. And now I just am coaching them. And that's what's, what's making it grow even faster. So it actually runs better without me. And then I can just coach people. Yeah. It's yeah. the way to do it. That's the way to do it. So uh, when's your, do you have an estimated date when you want to hit $100 million in the business? Well, we're growing at about 50 to 60% a year. Um, but I have a feeling this challenge we're about to launch is going to throw gasoline on it. Um, we're going to hit 10 by the end of next year. Absolute sure thing. And then 20 the year after that. Uh, and then, so it'll be within a couple years. It'll be the year after that. No, sorry. That'll be 30. So Sorry. Uh, Here's another interesting thing about Sharfin. He's got this thing called the billionaire code matrix. And it's this chart with, it's a grid and it has columns and it shows exactly from the start of your business up to a uh, hundred thousand, then a hundred thousand to 300,000, then 300,000 to a million, then a million to 10, 10 to 30, 30 to hundred, then a hundred and beyond. And it shows exactly what you need to be working on in your column. Oh, that's you don't incredible. want to go forward or you, 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 it, so, so we know what we're going to be focused on all the way up to that. So oh, that's it great. It gives us great clarity and um, it's, it's a really, really great tool. So we've got it all mapped out with that and things we're going to release. And um, at, at 30, there's a change in avatar and that's going to take us to 100. Nice. Yeah. Uh, wh what was the name of that chart? It's called the Billionaire Code. In fact, I think his site is for that is billionairecode.com, but it's Alex Sharfin. Check it out. He's really fascinating. He spoke at a couple Funnel Hacking Lives, and he's in Russell's inner circle with us. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, here's another thing. Okay. Yes. Mentors. Oh, they're huge, right? Yeah. So important. So I've important. always had them, even as a kid when I was juggling, there was some better, more successful juggler. <laughs> some better juggler. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A and it really is a shortcut. Oh, it's a huge shortcut. Absolutely. Yeah. Who are your mentors now? I'm, I'm guessing Russell and Alan. Yeah. Um, but anybody else? No, that's it at the moment. That's your focus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's huge. And you can even tell in your business model, like your business model needs mentors uh, for the other people that are creating businesses to survive and thrive and grow, right? Absolutely. So I'm learning to become a better mentor for our customers. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Yeah. Excellent. So I think unless there's anything else you want to touch on, which is fine if you do, I think we'll wrap up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Daniel, um, if the listeners, well, I, first off, I want to say this has been an amazing show. I really enjoyed chatting with you. Uh, if the listeners want to learn more about you and what you guys have going on, where's the best place they can do that at? Oh, the best place is just our main website, which is creditrepaircloud.com. And then if you scroll all the way to the, to the bottom, there's, there's uh, in the footer, there's links to everything. You can, you can get my book for free, The Ultimate Guide to Starting a Credit Repair Business. Um, you can hear my podcast and, um, if you have an interest in credit repair, all our courses, all our software, it's all there. Creditrepaircloud.com. 
Perfect. And if you guys are interested in studying good, healthy, awesome, creative business models, I'd recommend checking out Daniel's business model because it's uh, just what I've learned from the podcast and I'm sure you guys have too. It's a really, really smart business model. And, uh, and, you know, especially when you create business models that truly, truly just help people create more wealth, um, take their lives to the next level, which help more people and more people and more people. That's an amazing legacy that you can leave. So, uh, first thanks for, you know, making the world a better place, Daniel. And, uh, thanks for coming on the show, sharing all your tips and tricks. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been a blast. It's been fun. Listeners, thank you guys for tuning in once again, and we'll see you on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Hey, listeners, thanks for joining us once again. We wanted to remind you about our high-performance productivity coaching and our five, six, seven, and eight-figure private masterminds. These are all designed for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs to help you scale rapidly and grow. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com. That's thebusinessmethod.com. And we'll see you all on the next episode.